The best answer in this case is choice E, acquired cluster teratoma. So before we get to the key image and feature, let's do a quick basic review on the key anatomy that they may potentially ask you on the board exam. So the tympanic membrane has two parts, the small part on the top that's pars flaccida, and the rest of the tympanic membrane is pars tensa. Attached to the superior portion of the pars flaccida, you have a sharp bone point called scutum. And in between scutum and the uh, ossicles, you have a small space called prusac space, and that's a subcompartment of a larger space called lateral epitampanic recess. And you have a scutum right here. The prusac space is sitting directly above the pars flaccida. So for the key image you're finding here is, A, you see complete opacification of the middle ear cavity, as well as extension into the master entrum and the master air cell. But this finding is not very specific. Other more specific finding is that you have an expansion of the Prusak space. If you contrast that to the normal side where the Prusak space is clear and not expanded, setting above the pars flaccida, and Prusak space here is expanded. Also look at the sharp scutum on the other side. On the affected side, the scutum is blunted or there's evidence of erosion of the scutum. The icing on the cake for this case is that if you do a MRI with this particular diffusion with the sequence, you have a restricted diffusion. So now you have all the buzzword description for acquired cluster teratoma with expanded Prusak space, erosion of the scutum, as well as diffusion restriction. So how do you develop a acquired cluster teratoma? Recall the outer layer of the tympanic membrane is skin. So when you have chronic inflammation or chronic middle ear inflammation, you would cause eustachian to dysfunction. That will create a lot of negative pressure within the middle ear cavity. So the tympanic membrane got sucked in. The place that got retracted or got sucked in the most is going to be the weakest point, pars flaccida. So you will start to cause pars flaccida retraction forming a small pocket. And remember the pocket is covered by skin. So you continue to have this expansion of a sac that's expanding superiority into the Prusak space. And because the sac is filled with exfoliated, it's continue to exfoliate the skin, or you have all this exfoliated keratin debris, which is very inflammatory. That can cause a lot of erosion around the adjacent osseous structure, such as scutum. Now, it is also a very good culture medium, so the patient has a tendency to present with recurrent infection. As it continues to expand, you can see that it erodes through the adjacent structure. So one of the first things that we see is blunting of the scutum. Then you have expansion of the Prusak space. As it continues to become bigger, it may erode through other osseous structures such as scutum, excuse me, the ossicle, as well as superior extension, potentially extending through the tagment tympani, as well as laterally extending into the lateral semicircular canal or erode through the facial nerve canal. On otoscope, you will see evidence of prior inflammation. There's a scarring and retraction pocket of the pars flaccida. And cluster teratoma is described as pearly white on visual inspection. So you have all the classic findings for cluster teratoma was blunting of the scutum, expansion of the Prusak space, 
nonspecific pacification of the middle ear cavity. And in this case, there's some erosion close to the uh, facial nerve canal. And the tapman tamponi in here still is intact. On MRI, if you do a uh, diffusion weighted sequence, cluster teratoma classically show restricted diffusion. But you cannot really do, um, or at least it's difficult to visualize on your standard EPI diffusion weighted sequence. This is our patient, the same patient here of uh, his brain MRI. Notice that the lesion is very, very difficult to see with EPI diffusion. So EPI diffusion, our standard diffusion, is very prone to susceptibility artifact. So the area with a lot of susceptibility artifact, including air, master air cells, bones, and using EPI is very, very difficult to see a diffusion weighted sequence or restricted diffusion. So you need to use a technique that utilizes non agoplanar diffusion weighted sequence, such as haze diffusion. Now you can visualize the lesion much better with restricted diffusion. Do keep in mind though, you need to be a certain size. Otherwise, even with a non agoplanar imaging, it may be too small to adequately detect. So that's cluster teratoma. Um, let's talk about some of the choices that do not work as well in this case. A congenital cluster teratoma is coming from intraosseous inclusion of ectoderm. So in theory that they can occur anywhere within the middle ear or in the scopes or in the temporal bone. But elsewhere, we just refer them to as epidermoid cysts. They are identical to epidermoid cysts which means that they should look exactly like epidermal cysts in that they are brown T2. They should not have central enhancement unless it's infected. They may have thin peripheral enhancement and they show a lot of restricted diffusion just like any other epidermal cysts. The classic location within the middle ear for congenital cluster teratoma is the location adjacent to the cochlear promontory, just like in this case. Unlike uh, acquired cluster teratoma, uh, there is no prior inflammation. So if you look at the scutum, right, in this case is sharp, and the pursac space is, is now opacified, and the pars flaccida is completely intact. So therefore, there's no prior inflammation. And congenital cluster teratoma only account for about 2% of the cluster, cluster teratoma in general. They also look on visual inspection as pretty white. Again, notice difference here. You have a scarring and retraction pocket of the pars flaccida, and in this case, uh, pars flaccida is completely normal. For choice B, the otitis media with effusion or mastoid effusion. Here, you do have opacification of the mastoid air cells. However, compared to the other side where you can see the bony septas are intact, on this side, you can see the opacification of the mastoid air cell is um, there's erosion of the septa, so there's a coalescence of the mastoid air cell. So therefore, this cannot be a simple mastoid effusion. Choice B is wrong. For choice C, cluster granuloma. So cluster granuloma can occur in any aerated part of the temporal bone. The most common location is the uh, mastery air cell, and sometimes it can develop in the aerated petrous apex. It started with development of trapped mucosal or a developing mucosal edema that bleeds and re-bleeds. Therefore, it traps blood and that undergo degeneration. And you have all these blood products, inflammatory debris, as well as cholesterol, uh, cholesterol crystal that's trapped within the expanding mass. So because of the cluster crystals and the blood product, it makes cluster granuloma characteristically very bright on T1, unlike other entity. So if you want to tell them apart generically between the cluster granuloma versus cluster teatoma, cluster granuloma is very bright on T1, cluster teatoma is not. Cluster teatoma has restricted diffusion, and neither one of them should show significant enhancement unless it's infected. Lastly, for glomus tympanicum or paraganglioma. Uh, for glomus tympanicum, the classic location also is right at the cochlear promontory. 
So if you see a lesion that's going along the cochlear promontory, your main differential diagnosis can be glomus tympanicum or congenital cluster teatoma. The difference here is that this is a plerigen glioma, so it's a very vascular tumor. Therefore, when you give contrast on MR, you will see avid enhancement. Unlike cluster teatoma, it should not show any central enhancement. So if you were to tell them, uh, try to tease them apart, the difference is between glomus tumor versus cluster teatoma. Neither one of them should be Bryan T1, unlike cluster granuloma, which is Bryan T1. The cluster teatoma would have restricted diffusion. Remember, epidermoisis has restricted diffusion, whereas glioma typically do not. And the enhancement-wise, glioma is a very vascular tumor, though they should have avid central enhancement, whereas cluster teatoma does not. And if you see the lesion that's angry red, that's either glomus tumor, which is a very vascular tumor, or could be a potentially a, a barren vessel. Um, the congenital cluster teotoma, as I showed you earlier, is pretty white. So one is pretty white, the other one is angry red. That's all for this case. Good luck on your board exam. Thank you.